Hello everyone, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this video is Experiment Designs in Computer Science, Topic 6, Temple Sizes. So today we're going to do an introduction on the topic. Let's go. So in this course, up to now, we talked several times about the necessity of collecting a sample. A sample which is a set of multiple observations that are used to calculate the value of interest for the experiment. However, up until now, we have avoided talking about how many samples we need, how big should be the size of the sample. That will be the topic for today's lecture. So what we want to think about is, what is a sample size? Why do we need to worry about it? And how to choose and calculate this value? So um, the result of an experiment is affected by several factors, some of which are unknown or difficult to control. Because of these noise factors, sometimes there is a small variance in the result of repeated experiments. So when you do an experiment two times in a row, uh, the, the result is not exactly the same. To measure this variance, uh, we repeat the experiment several times and gather those repetitions into something that we call the sample. For example, uh, if we know what is the mean of throwing a dice, what is the mean expected value of throwing a dice? If we throw the dice only one time, maybe there is a three, maybe there is a one, maybe there is a six. That's not the mean expected value, right? Uh, if we throw three dice and add the values, the true mean is 10.5. But every time we throw the dice, the result will be a little bit different. So if we want to estimate the mean value of a noisy process, like throwing the dice, we can observe the process multiple times, which is a sample, and take the average of the sample values. As the sample size gets larger, the sample error usually gets smaller. However, the noise of the original process does not change. So increasing the sample size is a way to reduce the noise of a process that we are observing. Just to give an example, let's think about throwing three sizes. Three dices. If we throw three dices two times, we get a nine and a six, and our mean becomes something like a seven point five. If we throw the dice three ta four times, no five times. Note here that actually the mean will be higher here. We got uh, we got 10, 11, 9, 11, 12. If we throw the dice ten times, we got more and more values. And if you look at the mean, you know that the theoretical mean is ten point five. The mean of two observations was 7.5, with five observations was 10.6, with 10 was 10.7, and as we increase the number of observations, the standard deviation will start to go, will be about the same, but uh, the mean will approach the true value. So larger sample sizes help us isolate the error related to the noise of the process. This has an influence of the size of the confidence interval, the confidence statistical tests, the power statistical tests. That's why we want big sample sizes. So should I finish the class now and say, just get the biggest sample that you can? Well, not exactly. As much as possible is not always the answer when it comes to sample sizes, okay? In general, it's a good idea to have a sample size that is large enough, but there are other things that you need to consider. For example, many experiments have a cost associated with obtaining each observation. For example, if you are doing an interview, you have to group many people to ask the interview. If your, if your ex experiment has a monetary cost, for example, if you're running a computer experiment, there is an electricity cost. There is also a time cost. Maybe you have like a final report that you have to submit by the end of the month. And you cannot run infinite experiments because it will not be enough time, okay? Uh, sometimes the experiments require materials or conditionals that are hard to obtain. Uh, for instance, you want to test, uh, make interviews with people that went to Antarctica. There are not that many people that went to Antarctica, so uh, it's limited the number of repetitions that you can do. Another thing to consider is that the increasing in sample size has diminishing returns in terms of confidence and power of tests. There's a point where increasing the sample size does not give you as much benefit as the cost of doing extra experiments. So sometimes the cost of collecting observations is higher than the benefit. 
So what is an appropriate? We want to know, we want to ask ourselves, what is an appropriate size for the experiment? For the choice of sample size, we take three things into consideration. The cost of the experiment, the desired confidence, alpha, the confidence of the interval size, and the desired power. We have talked a lot about confidence so far, but not so much about power. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about power. Of course, um, calculating sometimes, even if we calculate the sample size, we don't really have a choice. When an experiment is constrained by budget, so we don't have enough time or we don't have enough money, we might not have a choice of sample size. But even if the sample size is fixed by the experiment conditions, it is still important to calculate the power of the experiment. If we calculate the necessary sample size, even if our sample size is fixed, we may know how trustworthy our experiment is, how what's the power of the experiment. So the power calculation tells us how we should interpret the results of the experiment. <laughs> to calculate the power of experiment, we need to first define the minimal interested effect size delta star. We have talked about this before. Let's give you an example. Consider a one sample experiment with the following parameters. Alternate hypothesis is one-sided. The sample size is 10, so this is a fixed sample size. The delta star is 0 0.5 and the estimated standard deviation is sigma equal to 1, and the, the alpha is 0 0.01. So in this situation, what is the power of this experiment? We can use the power t test in the, um, in the R, uh, the power t test function, and we give the input that we uh, discussed. And it will give to us a value of the power. So pow the power here is 0 0.16. So this is a beta of 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.84. So this is a very low power. So this experiment under these characteristics is a very, very low powered experiment. There's a high chance for false negatives for this effect size. So how can we adjust the power? How can we increase the power of the experiment? If we want to increase the power of the experiment, we can increase the number of observations. If we cannot increase the number of observations, we could increase the size of the minimal difference that this, this test detects. This calculation will tell us what is the minimal difference that our test will be able to observe. So for instance, if we do uh, the same function as before, but instead of defining the delta, we define the power. So we say that we want a power of 80%. In this case, it will give us a delta of 1.18. So this is the minimum effect size. If the real effect size is less than this, the probability of a false negative increases. So in the previous test, our delta was 0 0.5. Our test is not powerful enough to detect the differences of 0 0.5, but our test is powerful enough to detect the difference of 1.18. If we want to detect smaller differences with our test, we need more observations. So here's the trade-off. Do we want to detect smaller differences or do, can we do more observations? So using power calculations, we can obtain an estimate of the type 2 error probability. This gives us a better understanding of the ability of an experiment to detect effects of interest. The statistical test will have lower power for differences smaller than delta, but these differences are below the minimal interesting effect. So any effect greater than delta will result in a higher power for the test. So this is a technique that is useful to calculate the sample size of the experiment, which we're going to talk about in the next video. See you there.